Dan Stoller is the Willy Brandt Distinguished Professor at the New School for Social Research in New York. She spent a lifetime thinking carefully about issues around colonialism and politics, and today I speak to her about that, and I think her nuanced opinions come through. She has a new book out, Interior Frontiers, Essays on the Entrails of Inequality, that just came out on Oxford University Press. So without wasting any more time, here is my conversation with Anne. Okay, so Professor Stoller, thank you very much for speaking me, to me today. I appreciate it. Um, I think before we get into the substance of your work, do you mind giving us a short uh, academic autobiography of how you came to where you are today? Thank you, first of all, Nico, for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to read the kinds of questions that you're interested in and also to have this kind of conversation. When you say a small academic um, autobiography, it's always so selective, right, each time you do it. Um, I mean, I was thinking this morning, where would I start? Would I start with the fact that my sister, who I just sort of idolized, was a Sanskritist, um, nine years older than I, when I was a little girl. Mm. And she was basically doing translations of the Mahabharata, Ramayana, all the major, major Hindi, Hindi epics. Um, she would ask me what words sounded best in English when they had multiple meanings. And in some ways, my introduction to even thinking academically was through language, was through the precision of language and the multiple meanings that a word could have. But usually when I start talking about where I came from, it's anthropology because it just allowed me the most freedom. I knew that I was never committed to anthropology. Hmm. Um, I was always far more committed to thinking about social inequality. That was it. I was a young Marxist. I was a young feminist, even more Marxist than a feminist early on. I was reading, you know, Das Kapital. I was reading, you know, What is to be Done. I was reading Rosa Luxemburg. And I really thought they were more anthropological than a lot of what anthropology was doing. Hmm. Um, so the first work that I ever did before I was a graduate student was on, um, I was at Barnard College in New York, and it was on the rural roots of the Chinese Revolution. Then it was on um, oh, the sort of uh, the Cultural Revolution. Um, all of the work in the early period was filtered through mm. thinking about what other radical possibilities there were in capitalism. Um, so I went to Java right before graduate school, and um, I ended up in Java with a man, and it was a time of the Green Revolution which is World Bank and everyone else who was part of the establishment said, we're going to reach the poorest of the poor. And it was quite clear they weren't. They were going to reach the middle and the rich. And I decided to do a study of the women harvesters um, that were basically done away with during the Green Revolution. This was before I went to graduate school. And I ended up staying for two years in Java. When I started graduate school, I decided that this was too far from the belly of the beast. And I wanted to get closer in and decided to go to Sumatra, which was the site of the biggest multinationals in Indonesia. Unirail, Goodyear, all of the really, really almost global ones. That, And when I went there, many of my lefty friends said, Penny, what are you wasting your time on? Plantations are gone. They are over. They are colonial. You know, mm. you should be doing the sort of industrial. Mm. And I said, no. Um, so that was 
that was sort of the beginning of my work, thinking about what was still colonial about these multinationals and what were these landscapes within the, which they were situated. When you say, how did you get where you are? I mean, history and anthropology to some extent and philosophy and not comparative literature so much as novels have always informed what I'm doing. That writing process, that concept work at the same time, and those have developed just so much stronger in the last 10 years. Mm. So I think, is that short? Yeah, that sounds like an extremely exciting life or youth you know, spending in these countries. Well, before that even, I mean, you know, I, I protested the Vietnam War, right? I was sort of part of that. And I think I learned very, very early on, even before I was reading Foucault, that the politics of knowledge was for me the name of the game. Mm -hmm. That the first course I taught in 1983 was on the politics of counterinsurgency. And the terms that were used for what was Southeast Asia, how it was actually a military region. The name was given through um, that. So something about the political, actually I think has informed every course I've given over 40 years, mm -hmm. whether it's the politics of sentiment or the politics of counterinsurgency in 1983 or the politics of truth. All have been the courses that I've taught. It's never been actually the ethnography of X. Is there, and I can guess the answer, but I would like to know maybe the details of it. Is there something outside of politics that drew you to that Southeast Asian region? Or was it a pure Marxist drive? Well, it was a Marxist drive, but it was also a personal one. I mean, the personal and political always go together, right? Um, I was going to go there for a summer. I had a five-year fellowship at Berkeley and at Columbia, and I got hooked in Java. I got mm. hooked by the people, by what was going on, by the history. So it wasn't where I intended. I would have wanted to go to Vietnam, mm. right? But of course, at that moment, there was no going to Vietnam. Um, and when I say the belly of the beast, these were for me the belly agribusiness, mm. right? Now has exploded, absolutely exploded. Mm. But all of my work has sort of stayed on that edge. So when I was on sabbatical in Aix-en-Provence in 1997, I was supposed to finish my book on the archive, which didn't come out for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. I brought all my files with me. I brought all my boxes of archives with me. And it was a moment of Japan, of the extreme right, just rising. It's not that mm -hmm. they weren't there before, but they were really well. I put away all my files. Mm -hmm. I backed them up again, and I spent the year doing the work on the extreme right in towns near Aix-en-Provence. It was organic to me. Mm. Doing that and doing what I was working on, because they were both about what does the political look like? Is it in archives? Is it in the writing? Is it in certain kinds of practices? Is it in technologies? It, for me, was always a kind of open question. Um, which has even become stronger for me now to not assume I know what the political is, that it's, it's a labor movement or that it's the way you demonstrate in the street. But to ask that question always rather than know the answer to it and then go and study that particular group. So keeping this in mind, and you just mentioned a bit earlier Foucault too, who you've studied and read a lot, he was someone who stressed quite a lot the, the place that he's writing from mm. and i feel that in your writing there's a very distinct voice in your writing mm. and it really does feel like it's coming from a place it's not this disembodied kind of floating academic writing that we're used to what do you regard as the place that you're writing from and i'd love to hear what kind of place you imagine or what you see is that both. Is it in the tonality of it? Is it in the way it's constructed? Is it in the subject or the relationship between all three of those? What? Do you, what? I, I'm so curious. 
I think there are a few factors. Um, the first is just in terms of the language, in that it feels, like I said, it's not this disembodied academic voice speaking from uh, from the air, but it feels like a conversation you're having with a person. It's a, it's a person giving their point of view on something um, and not meaning that it's subjective or or unscientific in that sense, not at all. Mm. Um, just so interesting. It, it it feels like a like a real person <laughs> wrote this, and I think I want to also touch on that later. But how it's not restricted to one discipline or one set of vocabularies, but it goes across different interests almost, which again makes it feel like it's a real person. With, with their own particular interests and vocabularies that are approaching the problem of, of the paper. Mm, that's really helpful. Um, I don't imagine it myself as a real person. I, what I imagine it and feel and experience is a precariousness all the time. That where I want to be is what... Who Cohen's called, and this is, I didn't know this quote when I began, was in the sort of ethics of discomfort. Mm. That if I went to a comfortable place, then there was no point in writing. Foucault always said, if I knew the answer, then there was no point in writing. But for me, it was a kind of edge. If there was nothing edgy, if there was nothing I was almost scared of saying, I didn't want to write it. On the other hand, I was petrified that it would be rejected. So a really good example of this is um, a huge meeting of the American Anthropological Society in the late 80s. I don't know if it was 89. I had just moved to Michigan. And Edward Said was there. And it was, Edward was the person that five of us were responding to. All the other were really well-known men in the field, right? Renato Gonzaldo. I mean, it, it, it covered the rage of this young woman. And we were told that we would be given the paper to respond to the night before. It never showed up. Mm-hmm. At midnight. The paper was slipped under our doors in the hotel. I spent the night writing against it. Now, Edward was one of my heroes. I thought he was incredible. But I was really angry when he said in Orientalism that the sexual relation between European men and colonized women was just a, a kind of metaphor for colonialism itself, of who was on the top and who was on the bottom. And I knew it was not a metaphor. I knew it was practiced. I knew that those relationships mattered in the transfer of power, in the conquest of power, in a way that he never explored in the book. And so I went and I confronted him. And everybody else just did accolades to Edward because one should give accolades to Edward Said. Right? It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't talk to me afterwards. He's a very dear friend of my sister at Columbia. And right after that, we were at a dinner together at Columbia. And she had placed him next to me. And she had said to him, he wouldn't talk to me. And she, and she said, she could say it, even though she was really straight-laced. She said, Edward, grow up. And we ended up talking. Mm-hmm. Um, but then is an example taking something of someone I really, really respect and understanding what are the limits of what one takes. And that was true of Foucault as well. Mm. When Foucault says sexuality is a dense transfer point of power, I was writing my dissertation in Paris when I first read that. I was 78, Orientalism, and it was uh, the history of sexuality. Right there, in between 78 and 80, and I defended in, I don't know, 82 or something like that. But I somehow understood, even though Foucault would not 
really go there, that he couldn't discuss sexuality without discussing race and racism. He couldn't get there, but he refused it. But he put it in other ways. He put it, il faut défendre la société. Society has to be defended. Defended against what? Against the internal enemy within. That's still 40 years you know, later. It's really the what I'm looking at in the new book. The new book is called Interior Frontiers and um, Essays in the Entrails of Inequality. I mean, there's consistency there. I've done it in different ways. The writing, the actual writing, and the subject to become immensely more important, how those, those go together. But the vocabulary is an effort always to go somehow beyond the, the usual words used for something. Finding a way to touch people without having to resort to jargon. Mm. And that's how I teach. Students aren't allowed to use concepts without doing work with them. I said, I don't want to see biopolitics. I don't want to see, you know, Derrida in there, unless you work with that concept. So that became kind of a personal mantra for me, but also a pedagogic one. And that developed into the Political Concepts Project, a critical lesson, right? That you can't just appropriate. But I'd say there's fear in what I'm doing all the time. It's an age. And it's also endorphins at that very moment. It's endorphins in one time when I was writing Race and the Education of Desire. I got dressed like I always did to write, just put on my jeans, T-shirt, and I reached for my belt and realized I thought I was in a claim taking off. Mm -hmm. And that was the feel of it. There's something, that space um, was a taking off into another space. I smoked furiously at that time. I'd start it with a camel straight and I'd go into a zone. And it doesn't mean I was always successful in the zone. I mean, I, I had migraines all the time. I was nervous all the time. I had, you know, days when it didn't come out the way I wanted to and I just scrap it. Or I would scrap it and put it in a footnote and decide if it was really worth holding on to. But there was a tension and remains an enormous tension that is never good enough that I haven't said it well enough, that I haven't said it directly enough, that I've skirted the issues because I feel vulnerable in the face of that newness. So one time a, a piece I wrote called Racial Regimes of Truth, um, Virginia Dominguez was a commentator on it in a journal, and she said, Stoller is gutsy, as always. Mm -hmm. And... It was about the fact that essentialisms are at the heart of racism, but they're protean. They're changing all the time. It was an argument that flipped, not essentialisms as fixed, but essentialism as a moving category that gets used and reused in all kinds of different ways. But that's another example of a place I was scared. Mm. Right? And I just don't know if that kind of excitation of fear is also part of the, actually the process itself. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to convey in some of the work, I realize, and why the politics of sentiment has been so central, is some kind of sensibility that you carry with you in writing, right? That there's a rhythm to writing. So I write out loud. Mm. I want to hear it. I want to hear how it does a crescendo. How does the tone work? What does it mean when Ralph Ellison says that racism exists in the lower frequencies? The lower frequencies. Or at the end of the archive book, I say, what I want to do is write history in a minor key. Not minor history, mm -hmm. which has been used but a minor key where it's not the big chords, the big events, the cataclysmic ones, but that other space of a kind of doleful, it's not pleading, 
it's in another kind of form. It's never dramatic. It is where some of, I feel, some of the spaces of inequality both are produced and survive and are, are maintained. No, I think that's wonderful. I think I think that really answered my question. I when when you describe that, I feel like that's what I've I'm picking up when I read your work is exactly what you said. This I can feel the the rhythm of it, the humanness behind it. Yeah. So thanks. Well, thank you, thank you for asking the question because. It's hard to artic articulate, but clearly I enter a different space. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the writing zone and creative zone. When I get really excited, I have to move around. I have to move physically, mm. right? I, this is, it's, it's, uh, I used to do jumping jacks when I really got excited in that office. <laughs> just because there's some kind of major, for me, energy that goes into that space. It's like condensed energy. And it's not only in the main text. Sometimes it's actually in the footnotes themselves, mm. where I'm scared to say it directly, but I'll put it. So graduate students have said to me, you know, I've thought of my dissertation off your footnote. Mm. And, and I get that. I get that because it's where the unfinished idea resides in some ways, right? But also you, maybe I'm stretching this metaphor too far but you say you move around when you write you also move around between disciplines and of course this podcast is called undisciplined for a good reason right. definitely i think out of everyone that i've spoken with you're the <laughs> sorry to say you're the most undisciplined but it's a huge compliment in my books so and i i also feel this is a bit coming from from my side i feel we hear a lot about interdisciplinarity And it, people are very quick to to talk about it and to mention it, and it looks good on a on a project website. But when it actually comes to doing the work, people shirk very quickly from multidisciplinarity back into their own little corners. I think that's so true. Yeah. For as as much as they talk about it, that's how little they do actually practice it. But you don't do that. You you move around a lot. I was wondering, because this is my experience too, when people say this is undisciplined or multidisciplined, I think we might have this, I think you might share my feeling where you feel like, no, it's not necessarily multidisciplinary, um, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. You're exactly trying to get to the core of the discipline that you're in. How do you feel about that? And why do you not feel constrained? I'm not sure that we both agree that I'm trying to get to the core of anthropology. I don't think I care enough about mm. anthropology. So, um, and so that's, that's much more honest to where, where I am. I have never liked or used the term interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. Or, I think it's bogus. I think it's staid. I think it has a convention to it in which you're right. It's you're going to join these two up and then you're going to do this thing with them. But no, you want to wreck that. Mm. You want to wreck that ownership, that proprietary. You know, there was a period in the 80s and like all these historians were going to be ethnographic in what they were doing. It was meaningless. It was meaningless. It became very, very popular. Everyone loved that combination. I was part of a PhD program, History and Anthropology. Um, the students in it were amazing. They knew that interdisciplinarity was not what we were looking for. They knew it very, very well. But you're right, there was a strange way in which at times it was, I would be criticized in sometimes a nice way, sometimes not, but more often, sort of in an almost irritated way. And so I'd go to my feminist friends when I'm writing my dissertation in London and at Sussex. And I give them my paper. They said, what? what do you mean Foucault? What are you bothering with Foucault? Um, when I did a lot of my early work, oh, one of the first papers I ever wrote was called Class Structure and Female Autonomy. None of the words I would ever use again, structure or autonomy. But I said something like class is analytically prior to gender in this situation. <sighs> Obviously, I was antagonized. I was trying to antagonize. 
the second paper I wrote in graduate school was rice harvesting in Cali Loro, which was a total dismissal of gears. Again, who could have been more important in Southeast Asian studies and in anthropology? So clearly I was trying to kill off, you know, the patriarch of some the, of, of that discipline, but also was reject, rejection in some ways of the discipline um, itself. And I felt very early on that I was never a very good ethnographer, but also that there was something bogus about the notion that everyone became close to those people they worked with and on. And the kind of language that, you know, everyone got along so wonderfully with everyone that they used to call me older brother. Well, excuse me, right? This was an exchange relationship of a particular in a particular way. So I was always very, very self-conscious that there was just some kind of performative, and I didn't know the word then, didn't use it, this artifice of what ethnography was supposed to be doing and wasn't, right? And I pulled away from it in some ways. I pulled away when I was working in the archives um, of Vietnam and French colonialism that I couldn't write about French colonial work because I couldn't read Vietnamese. But I could work in the Netherlands and because I could read Dutch and I could speak fluently Indonesian at that time. So there was something that kept me, um, it didn't matter what discipline it was, from, it was from, in any way. When I was writing my dissertation, but much more even after, I just read novels over and over. And it wasn't, you know, just Simenon. It was colonial novels. I wanted to know about the intimacies only on the edges of colonial archives that were just the scribblings in the marginalia, that were a misplaced personal letter that showed up where it wasn't. I was very attracted to the notion of when Dutch colonials talked about how people felt Again, it was the pretense of ethnography for me. And I wanted to know how they imagined people felt. So this interdisciplinary came out of the kinds of questions I wanted to pose. When I turned to John Austin and a plea for excuses, empire is a plea for excuses. It's a constant, as Austin said, it's the adverb. I didn't really want that. I didn't really want to exploit people. I didn't really think it was racism. He says, beware of adverbs, because they're always a way of compromising what you're claiming, you know, and what you're doing. It's always a different kind of excuse. Um, I needed him. I needed to think with Austin, right? I needed to think with Gadamer that concepts make demands on you. When you hear a sentence like that you know that is coming from another place than conventional whatever philosophy is, whether it's continental or not. It's it's coming from a very specific place. Concepts make demands. It means you can't just use concepts. You have to understand at another level what mm -hmm. they're doing to all of us in a particular and what they foreclose. Mm. what they don't allow the space for and delimit, and what exceeds their edges, what are the places where it just overflows outside itself. So discipline is never, I mean, if you see my library, I think, well, you know, there's more, not just philosophy, but careful thinking, whether it be political theory or then it is ethnography, which takes up a smaller piece of where I get my energy, truthfully. So, um, you know, I, I teach in a prison, in a maximum security prison, and I, it's, it's not ethnography. It's mm. a history of the present. What does that look like? Whether it's through ethnography or George Orwell shooting an elephant, or it's through whatever else, right? It's not, it's, it's the demand is the kind of problematic that you pose rather than the discipline itself. Mm. And of course you could be seen as a dilettante too. You could be, I mean, you're, you're open, 
right, to attack in all kinds of ways. But, you know, what's the point in doing it otherwise unless you can really, really use – and I I really don't like when people say – and this is people who don't know my work the way you do say, I'm a Foucauldian. I don't mm. even know what that is. You know, we think with someone – because they excite how we're trying to get at a question. But it's not a, a you know, a, a devotional mm. project. Like it has to be with Foucault or it can't be anywhere else at all. You're not a disciple. I, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't have that in my life. You know, I, I've never, never had that. And when I did in graduate school, a name I won't mention, and I turned a little away, he basically disowned me because mm. I turned away. And that was the end. I was 23. I mean, I, I wasn't a good disciple. I really, really wasn't. Um, and I don't mean I'm so maverick. I just didn't get that. Mm. I don't mean that it, in, in any way. I think lots of people don't want to be and can't be disciples. And of course now... No one wants to, everybody wants to be on the edge, right? Mm. All of us imagine that the best places to be is on the edge, right? Right. I mean, that's just the case, right? You mentioned just now about how Dutch administrators thought about the feelings of, of those that they colonized. So I want to talk about that a little bit, emotion or affect, because my own disciplinary background comes is in law and you quite recently or a couple of years ago had an article about sentiment with uh, in politics and law yeah yeah so i i think this is something that's been very interesting for me lately too is this connection between affect and and the legal and the political but especially the legal and you quite effectively show how affect has been used legally and politically as a kind of dispositive. Absolutely. And we can see how that works, but can you explain that a little bit on the one hand, but also on, a, on the other hand, I wonder, I want to ask whether affect in law and politics, whether it's, it only has this dispositive character or whether it can also have the pharmacological aspect or element to it. Is there a redeeming feature in this connection between the law and affect? Well, I, I, I think a lot more work now is being done on that redeeming future. But I don't think enough work has ever been done on those sentiments that we imagine to be private, personal, intimate, and gendered, that actually are ways of seeing the distribution of power in themselves. And for me, diagnostics of how power relations work in subjacent ways that are not articulated as political. So some of the work I've been teaching, well, uh, courses on the politics of sentiment and what I've called affective states for about 20 years, more, 25 years. And one of the first things I ever wrote, again, very threatened of doing it, was at an anthropology meeting, I think it was an honor, of Eric Wolf, but I'm not sure he was on my committee and that we never really had much to say to each other. But, you know, he was one of, one of the heroes of a Marxist moment. And you know, I did a paper called Thinking Sentiment in Political Economy. Where did that come from? It's extraordinary that it is now, in a course I just taught as an intensive course in January, it's returned to alienation. And why alienation has been so flattened out as a Marxist concept. And what work, what didn't do with um, So for me, working through those sentiments that were always on the edges but never quite articulated was a way to read the archives differently than other people. And there was a quote that I think set me off very, very early when in a law document uh, about European equivalents in 1898, one of the criteria for deciding whether somebody could have European status was that they should not feel at home in a native milieu. Think of that half sentence, that they should not feel at home. 
how could anyone decide what someone felt? How would they know who would be the arbiter of it? What would that feeling of not being at home? So there's a bunch of things, also another law case in uh, in Andersheen at the time, of a mixed blood boy who they couldn't decide, who was the supposed son, maybe, of a poor French soldier. And they didn't know whether they should treat him as French or Vietnamese. Hmm. And it was all about his feelings. How did he feel about the German portrait on the wall? Did he hate the Germans as he should as a Frenchman? What did he speak comfortably? It was all, it was all framed mm. in terms of feeling. I would say that that period, 1990, is what really set me off on trying to figure out what, and then the first paper, I, yeah, I mean, I can just see the range of papers that just kept coming. Trying to get hold of it, trying to get hold of how sentiments political. But you've asked me when it can serve. And I guess one of the ways in which I think it's serving is to understand that envy, jealousy, longing themselves are political statements. They are not personal ones. They are the ways in which people find the critiques of the relations in which they're embedded and by which they're subsumed. Subsumption being a really important term in Marx that's very, very rarely used. But there Mm -hmm. is, it's not just domination. Subsumption, and I've never written this paper, actually. I wrote it in French. I did write a paper paper on subsumption when I was writing my dissertation for Maurice Godelier at the time. But I haven't written about subsumption as a sensibility, as a way in which one, the kind of duress that it produces, which is the title of my last book, that Mm. kind of waiting to be subsumed by other persons and other systems and systems in which you're swash. So... When you say, can it be positive, you know, in the early gay movement when shame was turned to pride. Yeah, but I'm not writing about it. I know that people mm. do, and they write about it amazingly, in which the, it's flipped. That mm. which you're supposed to be most ashamed of. You say, no, I refuse to be that, right? I refuse in any way. Mm. And there is really good writing on that in so many political movements, right? That turning, right, against particularly the concept, which is about your denigration, indignity, you know, and indignation against it, right? Um, yeah, I guess here we we look at Steve Biko for that. Yeah, yeah. But I was trying to do something else, I think. Mm. I was trying to look at, at another way, at what I call the distribution of sentiment, of who can have what sentiments towards whom. Who can you have sympathy toward? It's already a hierarchical relation. Who can be considered indirect? Who can be considered insolent? It's already deeply embedded in that concept itself. But that person should not have the right to speak to me that way. So it's more a kind of way to map with this distribution, relations of power that are not always articulated. But maybe, but also a powerful way to articulate it. And, and, and held within a word, within an adjective, right? Disdain, contempt. And there are a range of wonderful people with um, these subjects now. Um, and have been. Um, actually, somebody in the law school, I think she had a book on, on contempt, right? And humiliation and how it works. Right. I think one of the the key concepts that we keep kind of talking around so far is that of colonialism. So I want to address that head on for this question is that you also quite recently used the metaphor of diffraction, Mm. meaning how light bends around or with a certain object because obviously the light, the the bending light, we, we observe differently then. So... If we take the term colonialism as a 
scholarly topic or as a political topic, how does this diffract light? How do we see differently when we use colonialism as as our object rather than something like injustice, speaking from a legal perspective, or racism or class? You mentioned class right at the beginning of our conversation. How does that diffract the light differently from other concepts that we could come up that are closely related nonetheless? Again, Nico, you're always asking great and hard questions. I think the thing about diffraction for me is that it doesn't hit exactly where you expect it to hit. That there are things, there are, there are effects of it because of the object it's hitting, whether it be something going on in Hawaii or a nuclear um, buried bombs um, in Vietnam that it does different kind of work and it diffuses in a certain way depending on what that space of quote unquote the democratic is and what it does to the questioning of precisely those nodes within supposedly democratic polities. So when one looks at empire, right, and the way it diffracts on liberalism, something Ude Mehta and I have both done, how many years ago now? 25 years ago. There are parts of it that almost line up in particular kinds of ways that make you have to ask why that term why that process, why that history is coming in here and now. And what is, it's the Kantian question, what is this present that is coming up here now in this place? And that's one of the basic questions for me. It's not because I pretend to be an expert on Kant at all, but because that's a question I think is great. I think it's, it's like for me the question is this, it's um, somebody I don't know very well, but you should know one another, David Scott. And he asks, is this question worth having an answer to? It's a beautiful line, right? No jargon in it. No big, heavy-duty concepts. And it's how I usually open all of my seminars. Not de rigor, it doesn't have to be there, the first session doesn't, but somehow it always comes up. Because of this privilege, I only teach graduate students, that privilege that I have only to teach graduate students, and they have to be in a graduate program. Right? Mm. The most recent thing I've written on it is about this surge around the decolonial and um, a surge in which it's become, I think, almost a placeholder for so many problems within liberal democracy. It's become the term that's been called upon. Let's decolonize the library. Let's decolonize this. Let's decolonize the street. Let's, and I think it takes something away from some of the really intense sites in which these issues really matter in a different way. But I also think it obscures some of the very inherent features of liberal democracy that are already themselves. They don't have to import racism from the colonies. They don't have to import the kinds of inequalities that liberalism and democracy enforce. It's already part of that fabric. Mm -hmm. So in this book, I'm using a term that's, again, it may be problematic, but it helps me get away from the notion that the metropole is over here and the colony is over there, and that colonialism is here and democracy is there. The term I'm using and sort of thought I had come up with was imperial democracy, as if to make an argument that these cannot be separated out, that they are just part of one another. It turns out, after I wrote the paper, the essay that's part of this new book, 
I found out that Arundhati Roy used the term 20 years ago, imperial democracy. Mm. And I was just blown away. And it was with, within a um, set of interviews that were done with Howard Zinn. So I mm. got the, I got the CD for it, but mm. I couldn't get it. It's called Imperial Democracy. Isn't that mm-hmm. incredible? I think she's amazing. I think she is just one of the most radical, you know, across, across. And Chomsky said he thinks she is probably one of the most radical um, yeah. writers now and activists now. I mean, it's, it's deeply in uh, her work that kind of activism. She's done so much. She's done so, so much. Um, but imperial democracy is me trying to entangle even more, not disentangle these forms. And I think it says something about the ways in which histories have been written as these separate. Now everyone's writing about the effects, right, of empire and colonialism on the metropole. We used to write about the metropole on the Kong. Right now, we just write about the colony on the metropole. I've tried to resist that a lot. Um, one of the problems I see with a decolonial is that most of the people using it, and it's probably not the case in South Africa, but it sure is on the East Coast in, in, in the U.S., and way much more than that, people who have never, ever studied colonialism or know anything. The decolonial has just been this kind of signature move. And it has produced mobilizations, but no, I'm not sure mobilizations of what. Um, mobilizations against power, mobilizations mm-hmm. against empire, that we are at the center of empire, not just the figures on the monuments, not just Rhodes. Rhodes is just a tiny piece of it. And I'm worried sometimes that that deflects from just how pervasive it is. Not that it's just the bad guys. We have to take down their monuments. It's, you know, it, it's, um, it feels like what it moves from is real um, redistribution, redistribution of resources, um, rather than just marching against roads. If it's followed by them, but if it isn't, and if it satisfies too mm. much and is too comfortable, it's not the ethics of discomfort. It's mm. it's joining in. Yeah. So that's why I, I I cringe a bit. No, it's it's certainly not only topical, but also of course very sensitive. And I think you're able to express your position on it in a very nuanced and sensitive way. And I think it's important that we also have that that voice. But we're not allowed that conversation, Nico. Actually, we're not really allowed that conversation right now. I, I, I gave a version of this at the uh, annual uh, anthropology meetings, the sort of big lecture, um, the annual one in England. And it was, nobody said mm. anything. It was so on PC that I was saying. They didn't go, oh, you're wrong. I was giving the lecture, right? I forgot what it's called. It's, you know, uh, Fir- the Firth Lecture, the Raymond Firth Lecture. It, it was not familiar because everything was about the decolonial. And it seems to me that we need to think harder, right, about what is deeply written into the spaces of, of this larger polis. Mm. You can't just write about one piece of it. So that grew out of the work of Tensions of Empire, right? With Fred Cooper in 1997, actually the first conference from 1987, and it came out in 1990s. Most things take me eight years. <laughs> they do. They take at least that long. Yeah, but I mean, ha- having a a nuanced perspective on something takes time, right? It's it's like cooking. If you want depth of flavor, you need to cook it for a long time. 
<laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for thinking that. I do a lot of drafts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so many drafts. And I not only do the drafts, I keep the drafts with all the comments of friends and colleagues because I feel like that's something we don't do well in the academy. We do not acknowledge the intellectual genealogies from where we came. We'll always get authority mm. from having our footnotes be Derrida and Deleuze and Foucault and various others from whom we imagine. If we quote, we will be seen within that circle and get, get power from it. But the number of times that... So some of my work, you'll appreciate this, Nico. Someone will put in the footnote, well, Stoller says for the Dutch, but it's not a theoretical argument. It's that, that the, it's Stoller says for the Dutch. It's reduced. Mm. It's reduced to an empirical claim. Never, not never. I mean, there are many places where, you know, the do is, is gotten. But um, often it's not. Often, you know, it's, we're not honest to our intellectual genealogies, particularly when, you know, we'll put thanks in the acknowledgments, mm. but it's still different. It's still, there's all these gradations, right? That I feel are, I talk to students about it a lot, that you just, you have to, you can't just appropriate, mm -hmm. right? Because I think it weakens, it weakens what, what you're doing. I've been interested lately in, you called it the colonial laboratory, and especially the relationship of that with the law. But you make a distinction about the, you know, you already showed me that my work is out of date because you shifted away from the colonial laboratory to what you call the colonial archive. Do you mind saying what exactly you do you mean with this? What What is the shift mm. from the laboratory to the archive entail? Well, I think that I turned away from the laboratory for some really um, explicit reasons. The notion of a laboratory is it controlled experiments. There's an aspect of they're very disciplined. They're very precise. They are in a particular, particular enclosed space, right? And it assumes, in a way, a kind of control of the colonial governance and administration that they never mm. had, right? The laboratory, yes, they did go to, to do studies of botany. Yes, they did go do studies of other kinds of things and, of, you know, of medicine, of just a way. But the laboratory almost suggests a really passive population on which that work is done, whether it be mice, whether it be rats, whether it be anything else. And I don't like it. I don't like the, and the, the term itself is not mine. It's, uh, it's from Paul Rabinow, but mainly from Gwen Wright, um, who, who were partners once in another world. Um, and she used it in a beautiful book she did in, on a, a colonial architecture and talked about laboratories of modernity, that all of these forms were actually played out in Morocco in other places in part of particularly French colonialism. Um, but I think we've moved on in some ways from that notion of the laboratory of modernity. And people have worked the last 15 years on these alternative modernities that came out of, of colonialism that weren't colonial sites that were not all shaped by and dominated by colonialism itself. I don't think that um, there is a move for me, if I'm trying to be really clear about this, from the laboratory to the archive. Mm -hmm. I literally started doing the work by reading first medical and military documents that were not yet in the archive. And I was, I worked at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and they weren't archives there. They were the pamphlets for how to keep your health in the colony. 
but they were not about how to keep your health. Most of them were about how to keep your whiteness in the colonies, how to make sure you uphold what it mm-hmm. is to be privileged and white. And so the archive for me emerged on the edges first of the official act. It emerged in the pamphlets that you're not allowed to take out of the Bibliothèque Nationale and you're not allowed to even bring a pen in mm. to read them. It was in the demi There's a little room where you have to look at these, right? That were about tropical medicine, about contagion, about degeneration, about being susceptible, about how not to be sick, where your servants should sleep, how you should guard against them sleeping in the room with your child rather than on the floor in front of the door. To me, these were all the practices of governance at another register, right? But these were part of the archive. So I tried to find, I thought, after I started doing all of this work in 1987, I thought, now I'll go to the dissertations. The French history must be tons of dissertations. Zero. Hmm. None on exactly using those manuals, using that. There were none. So I went down to Aix-en-Provence, where they had all been moved from Paris, Rue du Nord, and um, I started working in the archives themselves, but found whenever I looked for something on sexuality, on prostitutes, on white prostitutes in Indochina, they were absent from the archive, not disposable. They were not available. Mm. And so I, I began to kind of see that the confines of what was in the official archive was only the smattering of what was actually part of this, these, these accounts. But I also started finding that in the Dutch archives would be newspaper clippings of things that demonstrated why they thought a revolt was in the making. Or a piece of literature, or a personal letter. And these belonged and didn't belong. So the archive, what is, you know, the two ways, they're the archives, and then with Derrida, archive fever, and Foucault, the archive. Mm. And several really wonderful people in philosophy have written about that distinction. Uh, Judith Rebelle, between the archive which is a kind of imaginary, and the archives. But I think the archives are a dense place of the imaginary. Hmm. Oh, how you can write, where you can write, how many duplicates you need to make, what are the sources off which you're allowed to write to claim this as hmm. truth. What and sort of one of the for me one of the important pieces that started the whole archive project was the last second to last chapter called hierarchies of credibility. How do you arrive at credibility in these different kinds of modes of of evidence making? Mm-hmm. That's where. So those are not about the laboratories, right? It's a really different mm-hmm. kind of. Sp- Based. Um, what's allowed in, what's not allowed in this. It was a, a, a very different kind of venture for me. Very, very up close. Mm. I mean, you know, just huge piles of how to bring up children in the colonies. Mm. These were all in German, right? At what age should you send them back to Holland so they become Dutch? At what age can they really learn a language? I mean, it was remarkable, remarkable what was in these little, these spaces in which these Dutch young people were learning how to be calm. They had to be taught how to make that distance, how to learn in Indonesian only commands, Mm -hmm. only a command. That's all they learn. Get this. Cook that. Do that. In fact, Richard Wright, when he went to Bandung in 1956, couldn't believe that the only Indonesian 
And this was the Bandung Conference of all the non-European co former colonies that had independence. They had to learn, he said, the only thing in, 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 the, Bahasa, in the language books had to learn Indonesian were commands. Mm. It's extraordinary. That's all they could learn. That's all they were taught. That's all. That already shaped a whole set of relationships. That is part of the act. Mm. So, mm. yeah. No, oh, thank you. That's that's fascinating. I think it's an important, as we said, how how objects diffract the light and affects what we see. I, I see how that diffracting light off the archive is very different from the laboratory, right? One of the things I try to do in two of the chapters, well, really one, just came out in Critical Inquiry. Um, it's called Archiving Praxis, and it's about Palestine and beyond. And it's about not appropriating or taking Israeli archives. It's about archiving as a political project, of creating, not taking them and reassembling the Israeli ones, but turning away from the Israeli ones and developing multimedia archiving mm -hmm. projects of their own. So it's not that I'm necessarily going there or I'm, all my work will go there, but it's different archiving than collecting the archives of the master. Mm. And I think it's happening all over. I think the aesthetics of dissent, all the sort of film and all kinds of media is literally what we can see all over Africa, right? And so much of mm. Asia as well. And I think, you know, in Native America, it's not just about what was done to them, but what they are mm. producing. Yeah, thank you. So finally, I just want to ask you, you just finished a book that's coming out. In, in two, two months. months, it's coming out. Do you mind just telling me what I can look forward to? I'm, I, I'm so bad at talking about something I've just finished. It's so hard for me. When I finish my dissertation, I collated it backwards so no one could read it. <laughs> and that's kind of a metaphor <laughs> for what, what I do. But one of the terms, the several terms that underwrite this book, one is interior frontiers to really, really look away from the, the border as a line, but as interior frontiers at a level of the polity and the personal that move through people themselves where there are thresholds in which it's not clear where they're going to stand. It's a kind of metaphor, but also a reality, an empirical reality of what I'm looking at. Um, but I'm not going to describe this well. I, I, I don't know how to. But one of the terms that's really important for me is shatter zones. I'm looking at what I call the shatter zones of any class. And shatter zones are terms, really orientalist term that used to be used by kind of mainline, mainstream political scientists only to talk about the Middle East, where primordial loyalty is in conflict or rife, never used for Europe, never used for Euro America. I've taken that term and turned it around and say these are the shadow zones of imperial democracy, of, of, of racism. Uh, all kinds of inequalities that I'm arguing are inherent in it. And um, yeah, it's on the borderlands of interior frontiers that interest me. Those that are not fixed, it's not a line. It's not definitive. It's, it's where the, the tensions are really, really there. And sometimes subjacent and sometimes really, really clear. But, you know, the, the chapters, I mean, I call them essays, are, you know, one is called Weaponizing the Senses. Um, another one is what I call Poetic Rage of the Anti-Colonial Avant-Garde, that it's not in Europe where the Avant-Garde was located, but in, it was a place to, a way station to pass through with a whole set of anti-colonial, other kinds of, movements is probably the centerpiece of the of the book besides the interior frontiers is the third chapter is called do you speak french i'm currently learning french but 
I'm not confident okay. enough to say I speak it. Okay. Well, it's a piece about the dis, in parentheses, the taste of race. Mm. The mm. degu, disgust of race, and the gu, the mm. taste, the, the, what we talk about food, having a wonderful mm. taste. And I'm looking at that relationship in, um, in both Kant and Bourdieu, Kant's notion of aesthetic judgment, but also Bourdieu's book on taste, and what he called distinction. The, the first words in the book are taste, mm. and why race is not a part of a 500-page book by Bourdieu, who fought for rights in North Africa, who studied Kabir, what happened to distinction and taste that could totally marginalize the question of race in France. He says it's very much a French book, mm. but it's, it's a kind of amazing compendium, 500 pages on taste and how it's distinguished. And nothing on this. And we tried to buy, right? And I've been working on this for 10 years, probably, this idea, not working on it explicitly, but this idea of rewriting Bourdieu's book of distinction through mm. race and what happens to his project in doing so. No, I'm, I can't wait for it to come out. They were projects that came out, some of them out of being invited to do sort of big things in another venue and to art historians to, you know, they, it, it came out of so many different mm. venues. Um, so I, I hope it's a bit interesting. No, I'm sure it is. I'm looking forward to it a lot. So thank you, Anne, so much for talking to me. Thank you, Nico, for having me.